Hi, this is Peter Gould. I'm a co-creator and executive producer. Hello, this is Tom Schnauz, writer of this episode. Hi, this is Michael Morris. I'm the director of this episode. I'm Patrick Fabian, and I play Howard Hamlin on the show. And this is Philip Palmer. I'm the production sound mixer. And here we are in Red Cloud. And we are looking at Kate, Katie Beth Hall, right? Katie Beth Hall, great young actri actress. Brilliant. And uh, driving up will be uh, Beth Hoyt, who plays her mom, another just two terrific actresses who really, I, you know, I don't know if they studied Ray Seahorn or what did they do, but they really... <laughs> they did. They, they, they definitely did. I, I think Ray is, is absolutely a presence in this scene, you know, thanks to these two amazing performances. Was she also off, off camera telling the girl what to do? <laughs> <laughs> She was there on the, uh, we shot this scene over two nights um, and it was contrary to the brilliantly constructed snow, it was boiling hot. Um, but Ray was there on the first night. Wow. And, and that was a, that was a huge, uh, that was a difficult thing about the sequences because we have an underage actress and it's summertime. And so the sun went down kind of, uh, kind of late. So we only had a, you guys only had a few hours with this young lady, is that right? Y yeah, yeah, and she was uh, she was really extraordinary right from the start. There are some things that she does in this shot. I, I I remember the focus she has and the determination she has. That look away, and the mouth. That's Ray to me, and you'll see it later in the episode. We were able to shoot a little bit past our our hours because uh, we had a we had a double for some of the old over the shoulder stuff. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to release our actress at uh, whatever time she had was allowed to work to like midnight, I think, and then shoot. Again. You're absolutely right. She was great. The, the an hour or two after the double too. Yeah. Is there anything in the cello case or is it empty? <laughs> great question. It is full of a cello. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know something else uh, interesting about this this scene is that uh, Red Cloud Elementary is actually a digital effect. Uh, I actually had an a, 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 a critic ask me if uh, if uh, the mother here was actually Ray in makeup. I love that. <laughs> what a compliment, huh, to to Beth? Yeah, Beth Beth really nailed it. And she's a, she's a great comedian. We love comedians on our show. They they do such. Because I, I always feel like it, it, it's very hard to do comedy, and it's a little easier to do. It. <laughs> if, you can, if you can be funny and get laughs, that's a difficult thing. But uh, uh, comedians usually bring so much to the show. This is one of my favorite teasers. I just love how intrepid this young woman is. <laughs> I love how how you constructed this this teaser uh, without explaining anything which I love and going straight from a glimpse into the past of Ray into a glimpse in the, into the past of, of Kevin Wachtel. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Again, this was so hot. Oh my God. <laughs> so how much hot. fun was this though? I was so happy. I was so happy with uh, that, that I got to do this with you guys. It was so much fun to shoot on, on this old film stock. Right, this is right in the back lot, really, essentially, right behind the studio in, in New Mexico. Yeah, right down the road, and we, we scripted, uh, you know, 60 millimeter reversal film, thinking, oh, maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't, and luckily we got to got to work with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It it just has it has a tremendous conviction. I I, I always feel like uh, when I see simulated old film, I feel like I can often tell. Oh, and this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Just turning the actors around in place was a brilliant idea. I love that. Just turned them around. <laughs> the Media Lab has a vision mixer. I think we could get the effect that you're going for. And here's a very tiny set. What's it, what's it like working in this space, Michael? This oh. is, uh, it's uh, well. The good thing is in this space is you're pretty limited. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's not that. Much. In fact, I remember. Um, you know. Uh, when Josh stands at a certain point, that was a giant move for us. Big decision. <laughs> You're stretching the limits. I love this little set. It communicates so much about, about where he is in his life. It's actually so small that we can't shoot in there without pulling a wall out. Yep. Yeah, this is a, such a great set. We have midterms. 
And plus we have it actually looks bigger on film. It's, fu it's funny. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that I, I think Vince, Vince kept saying, let's make the set smaller and smaller for the pilot. And, uh, I, you know, it's 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 amazing how big it actually looks the way the, way the, way it's the shot, lenses it's... get wider and wider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a small set to begin with. Then we stuff it with uh, file boxes and clothes yeah. hanging from the ceiling, and it gets even tighter, <laughs> tighter in there. It, you know, if if for real fans of of the show, they can, it's it's absolutely worthwhile freeze framing and seeing if you can catch a glimpse of these storyboards, which were fantastic. The storyboards are all real storyboards that that uh, Jimmy um, lovingly made. I wish that we'd have more chance to see them. They're fantastic. Uh, you know, one thing I forgot to mention about that that great uh, Mesa Verde ad is that the, the uh, Kevin's father's played by Jay Johnson, who's an extremely funny comic actor who was on Mr. Show. And uh, so mm. it's just it's ironic that we gave him a role on the show, but he does not share a screen with Bob. But uh, if you if you ever get a chance to look at some of Jay's sketches from Mr. Show, he's he's a, he's a remarkable talent. Particularly the uh, the story the story of Everest that is one of my favorite sketches of all time that, that <laughs> he wrote and stars in. Speaking speaking of funny though, I mean Josh, the camera guy, is fantastically funny. His his impersonations of Werner Herzog alone. <laughs> he does, yeah, Werner Herzog narrating oh. the rap he was doing on set that day it was very <laughs> brilliant <laughs> very funny all three of our all three of our UNM and people uh, Josh Vadim and Julian Bonfiglio and Haley Holmes is so love oh, work great and yeah, go ahead Michael talk about this I, I was just so happy that, that again I felt like I I, I, I was um, really given such a great opportunity here to every time Jimmy gets to engage with film shooting film being a director Working with actors, it is my favorite. I mean, you've done it all the way through the life of the show, and every time you do it, I love it. So this was a, this plays right into Bob's brilliance as well. So many great instincts. Yeah, I got the chance to visit set that night as well, and uh, the joy, the play that he brings to it is so palpable and effervescent. I'm sure you, I'm sure you must have had to leave painfully. So many good takes oh. on the floor. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, usually people ask us how much of the show is improvised, and the answer is usually not very much or almost none. But I, I don't know. Was it? Is there any of this improvised, Tom? Not right here. Not what we're watching. This is this is by. I loved writing all this uh, di directing, <laughs> contradictory directing. That's the best, uh, Tom. Look, look at the lens, <laughs> the, but don't look at the lens. I, I, I saw myself away, in this so much. <laughs> But this sequence oh. here, where 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 all this uh, this montage here is all Bob, all the all the guys improvising, Haley and Josh and everyone, you know, just just running free and <laughs> and Michael covering the the angles here. It was really, you know, it's worth saying because I, you know, just in case it's interesting to anyone, there is, I mean, this show has a beautiful color sense all the way through it, um, all the way through the life of the show, in fact. And here, the big element, of course, is green. Um, and uh, and you'll see very soon after this, it's just worth bearing in mind when we cut out of the scene after this with Ray, the color, sh the color scheme is going to shift to a very d different tone when we go to Nacho and, and, uh, and Gus. But here it's driven by this kind of gleeful, kind of bright green, I think. And, and the green screen brought me one of my favorite moments uh, <laughs> right here. just the uh, camera guy's arrogance about uh, oh a green do you have a green screen to, yeah. you know when, when Jimmy offers a blue screen and him just yeah. <laughs> just shitting on Jimmy smile turn sideways <laughs> take your coat of course brilliantly cut by Skip McDonald uh, he's he's a maestro of the montage I mean he's amazing with this stuff He's got a really good musical sense for it. Yeah, we, I mean, I remember sitting, we were all parked outside uh, watching the monitor while this was going on. And we were just all just laughing and wanting more, <laughs> just wanting him to do more and more. Uh, Bob was so funny. I, I was there that night and I remember uh, there was a like a five minute reset and Tom ran back to his trailer to write episode nine because he was also writing episode nine while, while this episode was shooting. Crazy. <laughs> he's the, this is he's one of my king. favorite moments. This, this light coming on right here mm -hmm. 
shifts the emphasis from an, a wide shot of what we've been seeing to her story, which I think is really important right here. And you'll see that the next scene, which is obviously Ray pulling him back from something that he loves to do, is all on the on, on the outs on the exterior side. We never go into the room again. It just says so much about their relationship. I mean, they have such fun doing what they're doing, but this is a moment we realize it's not a straight line for, for Kim Wexler into to corruption. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, she's feeling, after being confronted by uh, Rich Schweiker in the previous episode, she's she's pulling back and having second thoughts and even willing to pay money out of her own pocket to, to make things right. You coming in? Because hey, we still got a slice or two of pizza left. Uh, no, I, 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 uh, sure. Phil, what's the, yeah. what's the challenge of miking a scene like this? Because these guys are right next to... Um, they're outside and they're right next to glass. Does that make a difference? Yeah, uh, sometimes. Uh, for the most part, we're you know we're we're driven by the headroom. So, so and our actors are these guys are just so resonant in their voices and they project. We're able to kind of um, do it a couple of different ways. So, you know, this was this was this was a microphone right above their heads and and recording their performance. We also have a very busy roadway to uh, to the right, uh, to, uh, now to the left of the screen. Yeah. So that's <laughs> just... Well, doing, luckily, yeah, we were very late location in <laughs> Well, you know, also that night when I was there, I was there to, uh, to watch. Uh, there was two fans that had landed in New York and made right. their way out to Albuquerque. I think they were from Scandinavia or Norway, but they literally had crossed the Atlantic Ocean to come and try and find us. And they did. They found us and they sort of lurked in the parking lot and Ray saw them and went over and started engaging with them. And she was like, oh, my gosh, next time you have to take a better vacation. So <laughs> <laughs> but in that in that mode of inspiration, you know, uh, she got everybody to come over and say hi. And we all came over, took a quick break and took a photograph for them. And it was just a reminder of the dedication of the fans out there. So if by any chance, the two young ladies who came from Norway to Albuquerque, this is for you. This was your scene as well. <laughs> they, had, they had taken the uh i think they had taken the breaking bad tour uh in the uh in the rv earlier in the day and had been given some notice that we might be shooting over in this area so they took it they they took it upon themselves to seek us out uh please don't do too much of that folks out there uh, <laughs> just, just, just to say just to say oh yeah uh, sorry. Sorry. and we gave them t-shirts and we gave them rolls on the show <laughs> <and> <laughs> that's so funny to be out location scouting and how often we will cross paths with the uh, the breaking bad rv tour i think we were arriving at this very location once when they were just leaving no. And it's definitely at uh, when we've got the twisters, we've crossed paths with them while they're visiting uh, Poyos Hermanos, and we were there scouting for locations. Okay, right. Amazing! I think Vince was running out the door as they were walking in one <laughs> time because he didn't <laughs> want right. to be mobbed by them. We were—I remember we were shooting on one street downtown, and the the tour bus was audible one street over. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here we go! Here's the red that wow. I was uh, talking about. This is a location we've used a bunch of times. This is uh, one of the it's most worked out great amazing for us, but Phil, location. I remember <laughs> this is the worst I've ever felt for you, Phil, on this day, because you were sitting outside with the microphones that a train oh, was God, going Phil. by. Oh, God, Phil. I dream about that. That was and awful. The engineer decided to blast this uh, train horn, which I remember almost knocked you on your ass. It did, yeah. It shut me down for, for, for a good half hour or so. <laughs> Because you've got the mic, you've got the headset on. <laughs> this shot right here was about answering a question asked in the last episode. Essentially, is Mike still with Gus after their last encounter? And I, and I like how this, there oh, this he comes. This is great. Right there. Did you plan this, Michael, or was this just a... Yeah, uh, no, that was planned, that, that one. And also there was, a, unusually in a way for, for for this show, at least in my experience of it, I had a, it was a much more kind of um, formal blocking in this in this sequence, almost sort of uh, yeah. You think of I don't want to be too pretentious here, but you think of like a Shakespeare play or something, a history play where you've got like opposing forces coming and negotiating and talking, very centered, a lot of center frames here, and like that. But it's super fun, and and this location is just it, you can't believe it. Just is what it is. Marshall, our amazing DP 
did such a great job here because it looks like it's all just naturally lit. But to balance the amount of light coming in, he had to he he, he put some really creative uh, large lights uh, just off. What else? He talks about a lot of things. And this is our first time seeing Mike uh, since the last episode down in Mexico, mm -hmm. deciding to join with Gus. So we had a lot of discussion in the writer's room about do we explain why he joined or um, or just get into it? And we decided to just get, get into it and we pushed off the explanation until the next episode when he's home with his uh, daughter-in-law, Stacy. Sort of sums up the re his reasons for doing what he did. Peter, Peter and Tom, this is Patrick. Um, I'm more curious about why uh, Nacho has a much cooler car than Howard Hamlin. Can we rectify that, please? <laughs> what is cooler than a, a, a green Jaguar? Wait a minute. I don't know. Look at that car. Look at that car. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> Mando, Mando would take pictures of him with his car and send them to me and say, jealous yet? <laughs> <laughs> this scene breaks my heart. You know, the, I, I love that there's that heart of tenderness in, in Mike. The father-son thing is always going to appeal to Mike. And, and as we know from previous episodes this season, Werner is still very much in his head. You know, so he's... He, He's actually a great target for Nacho's kind of appeal here. Bleeding out in the desert, all part of some plan. Right, it's the first time Mike is hearing about a, a gun to Nacho's father's head. It's yeah. A tactic he does not agree with. And I think he actually, we, we see through Better Call Saul, and as we get into the Breaking Bad years, that uh, Gus actually adopts some of uh, Mike's methods of... of some of his phrasing trying, trying too. to not to not use fear as a motivator mm -hmm. well he's, 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 and these two these two are just magic together these two actors they're yeah. just, they're, it's it's like uh two contrasting in, instruments they're both so they're both so expressive in such different ways And this is this location is actually a, uh, an old rail yard. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is a signature location in Albuquerque, and the building that we were in uh, actually was where the locomotives were serviced. They used to be hung from the ceiling. It's remarkable. And right to the left of that, where we were just looking, was uh, a spot where uh, Jesse Pinkman and, and Mike came to do uh, drop offs back in one of my episodes in. Uh, Breaking Bad uh, shotgun number five hundred four. We we've used that location so many times, and it, it just it just it's just fantastic. Congrats to you guys. Speaking of fantastic, here's Dennis Pitsikaris. Dennis Dennis is great, and so is Austin Boyce, who plays uh, Kim's assistant Marcy. She's she's just terrific. They both are, and Pitsikaris Dennis is is uh, he's just a remarkable actor. He's always fun. He's, it turns out to be a great boss. A great boss, actually, yeah. And, and, and someone who, it's, it's so surprising because you, you sort of, you take a sort of first glance at the dynamic that they have and you think, oh, he's just a real hard guy and like she's, but actually he's, he's, really, he's really understanding with her. Every time he could be angry or, you know, somehow aggressive or defensive, he surprises me every time. Yeah, he did in the previous episode. He really did sense what was going on. I mean, he knew there was something underhanded. But the the way things have played out now, that there's uh, an apparent agreement uh, with Jimmy, um, that maybe things weren't exactly the way he saw it. Kim, you have a bone to pick with. I love the I love the advice that he gives right here. You want to lose your shit? That's all right too. You want to lose your shit? It's okay. Just not in front of our troops. <laughs> he's, it's, he's a he is he is an excellent boss. I wish I had a boss like this. <laughs> oh, my boss is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not in front of the troops, Tom. It's it's such a tender point for Kim because uh, her boss really has seen that she's possibly up to no good, and. Uh, but now, now the now the situation seems to be somewhat resolved. I love this set too. It's an interesting problem we have is we have these different 
law firms like HHM and, and uh, Schweikert and Coakley and Davis and Maine, and each one has its own, its own unique look. This is, of course, uh, on the stage. And it makes, uh, you know, Schweikert's attitude here makes what's coming up even mm -hmm. when Jimmy comes into the boardroom even worse. It's, <laughs> it's terrible how he, in Jimmy's word, how he sand, sandbags or the old switcheroo. This is, I, I can't be the first person, and I hope not the last person, to beg you for a Dave Clark Investigates spinoff of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that would make me so happy. <laughs> I love I love Banks and Dave Clark mode. Yeah, and we have uh, Leela Lee here, who's actually a very good cartoonist. Very, I mean, she really when she auditioned, she really popped. I mean, we she's wonderful. There was an element. Uh, she had something that just made us smile when she when she did her audition. Is it true, Tom, that that, that there's a name check on the book here coming up? There is the little, the little Prince is a shout out to uh, to Jonathan Banks's nickname for me back in season four. <laughs> back in season four, of Breaking Bad, because I like things a particular way. He would announce to the crew that oh, the Little Prince wants it a certain way. Uh, that, that really stuck. So I had to when I had an opportunity to get the Little Prince into the show, that uh, I had to take it. And then then we follow up with the Little Prince, and we actually had to get the rights to the book. Yep. Mm. All because of Jonathan Banks' sharp sense of humor. And this uh, this character here uh, that Leela is playing, the librarian, really is an example of the you know the writers when, when we're breaking these episodes, trying to use all parts of the buffalo. And we you know we had this moment back in in season four where a woman peeks through a window and sees Lalo, and Lalo waves her away. I'm not even sure. And, we decided not to let just let that go and let that drop and 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 use the Fred Whalen murder as a very important piece coming up. Not only in in how they undermine Lalo, but also in, in Jimmy's psychological evolution. You know what this what it means to defend somebody who who did, just did such a ruthless murder. And I am trying to help them. So I like uh, you know when we're in the room, we're always looking forward, looking back. What what pieces can we use? Uh, that exists at our show. But it's all completely planned, right? From day one of the, when we opened the writer's room, we knew, we knew every, every beat that was going to happen. Of course. I also really like Jonathan Banks when he's in the, in his sleuth mode. Yeah. When you, when you realize the thing that's happening has been planned and methodically thought out, it just reinforces all the qualities that uh, I admire about Mike. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I totally agree, Patrick. And I think, you know, if Columbo had his sort of aw shucks thing, which was so brilliant, I feel like Dave Clark has this world weariness he comes with and just this relentless look. This, he exerts all this pressure on this poor woman without doing anything. She yeah. never has a chance of, of saying, no, she's not going to call the cops. But love. It's, it's interesting. I had uh, this... I was thinking about uh, an incident from my own life when we were breaking this, uh, which was I, I was held up and I had to identify. The police asked me to identify the car mm. that the uh, the person with the gun was driving, and uh, I couldn't identify it to save my life. And they kept saying, "You know, look, just take another look here. Just take another look. Does this one look familiar?" And I, I really wanted to please them as as uh, as this character does, as Lily does. But uh, I, I didn't because all I remembered was the barrel of the gun pointed at me. Oh, <laughs> literally. Fair uh, enough. So I just love the way Mike is. He's kind of forcing the deck here a little bit. It's really a magic trick that he's doing. Yeah, he's, just, he's, he's, he's making her pick the car, the right card. Is this the car? So, Michael, here you are in another <laughs> very small room, huh? Oh, I know this one. And long scenes in small rooms. There's a, there's a theme emerging. Uh, Sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> this was great, though, because it, because there really isn't. I mean, this is a good example of, I, I think, from a director's standpoint, of one of the things that makes the show uh, unusual and enjoyable, which is you 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 stage the scene. You try to stage the scene as the scene demands, right? And the scene does not demand superfluous movement because they're sitting and talking, and so I think the show allows for that kind of stillness. Whereas I think in, it, sometimes in shows, 
there's a real effort to try and get people on their feet, to get people moving, to get the camera moving. And, uh, and here I think the, the scene gets to be what it is. And so you can focus on, the, on what's going on. Here's Mike bringing out a familiar name, Detective Tim Roberts, which uh, eagle-eyed viewers will know that this is a, uh, a character from the world of Breaking Bad who was uh, uh, Hank's buddy in Homicide. Oh, okay. Nigel Gibbs. A great, That's right. Wonderful actor. 1970 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. <sighs> great. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind... You know, I, I do remember that we spent a lot of time trying to understand how Mike could make this work. Without without alerting the police to his presence, <laughs> that was tricky. Oh, absolutely! But he gives them the credit. I love that he says, "Don't I don't need the credit." <laughs> I just want <laughs> <you. laughs> this is a really elegant solution. <laughs> oh, that, that great last look. Oh, well, here we go. This feels this this feels so like a perfect moment between Jimmy and Saul because he's actually he cares about these guys. He doesn't want them in trouble. You know, he's he, he's proud of the work they've done together to get them off. And uh, and and without, you know, they escape without punishment. And he doesn't want them back in court again, which I love. And uh, and it feels to me, and this is the way we came at it, that it's only now that that uh, Kim has cut him off from his sort of uh, his fix in this episode of pulling a fast one that he decides, I have a great idea. Sorry, Patrick, Howard's going to suffer. <laughs> you know, these two have, were absolutely brilliant jerry and Lacey were absolutely pleasures to work with from from the first moment and they spent so much time together they just developed a really good rapport with each other michael i have a question yeah when you have like this in the hallway or things like this do you, do you have an idea of how it's going to play out or do you let the actors kind of let it get on its feet and sort of see how it evolves well i mean you want to definitely do that um because the all the actors that that we work with here are, are such a are of a caliber that they'll definitely bring something that uh, that you haven't thought of but in that case it was it was very blocked in the sense that we knew they were going to leave him at one end of the hallway we were set up and ready for him to run down the hall mm -hmm. and uh, and stop them just before the end so the blocking had had a shape that survived uh but yes i think you you see what they're going to give you mm -hmm. Um, and here we are, Ed, Ed Begley Jr. again. It's so much fun to be around him. And having a rapport with him is the easiest thing in the world, you know? And so this, this dialogue that you gave us about basically corporate idiots is, is so, is so <laughs> easy, which unfortunately comes very naturally to both Ed and I, it seems. So I'm not sure if we're tight cast or not. <laughs> that, was some of, that was some of my proudest writing there, which is uh, stale jokes for stiff white guys. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> really good. Glad but, but Patrick, I mean, this this delivery you have of Joe Dog and Tugboat is one of my oh, favorite. Oh, Tugboat. <laughs> Tugboat. I can't, stop, I can't stop watching that. It's so good. Yeah. Well, again, Jerry and Lacey really just uh, sell it so well without overselling it. And it's so easy to just receive it. You know, it's... um. You guys create a great situation and uh, nothing else to be other than awkward in it. I mean, maybe there's a space in the DVD extras, I don't know, for some of the incredible ad-libs that happened at the end of this scene oh when we were God. actually outside looking ah. in so we don't hear them. But but between Patrick, you you and, and Jerry and, and uh, Lacey together, so many brilliant things. I mean, the whole audience of extras would applaud every time when I yelled cut. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you know, and this is always one of those fun scenes. That's, again, when I watch the show and I see all the different elements, such a different scene than Mike and Nacho together, such a different scene than Jimmy and Kim. And there's, a, there's sort of a joy and effervescence to be able to be a part of this. Of course, I cannot believe you cut to the lead of the show for the end of the scene. I'm doing my best work, but that's all right. To be expected. <laughs> look, at, look how Ed Begley, even from a distance, just looks bemused and lost slightly, which is just so great. Uh, and you know what? Because of that scene, it's... Uh, it's that weird thing. And from the very beginning of the series, uh, people were sort of against me as the Lord Vader antagonist to, to Jimmy. Mm. And it's come all the way around to something like that scene. And I get lots of social media feedback of saying like, oh, poor Howard. And I thought, you know, that's tip of the hat to the writers and the directors and everybody else to make a character go from that to that in four seasons. 
Well, everybody, you know, immediately sees that the most handsome, symmetrical guy on the show, and, and assumes that he <laughs> must be the bad guy. But, you know, it just shows you good-looking people have trouble, too. I've been called a lot of things, Peter, but symmetrical is not one of them. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth, it's worth pointing out as well, storytelling-wise. Bob is very wise. handsome, too. Hold on. I'm sorry. I have to, I have to say that also. <laughs> There's something that you guys did in, in, going out of that act, uh, that one of the most important transitions in the episode. That's it. When you look back on this episode, that's the moment that he decides to do something that he promised not to do, to potentially ruin this effect. And as you always do, you did it with no explanation. You did not speak it. It was really, you reward the, uh, the careful viewer, I will say that. Well, Michael, you know, you have such a, a beautiful way of uh, distilling the essence of these scenes and uh, understanding where all those transitions are. It just makes, it makes uh, one of the things that makes working with you such, such a pleasure. Michael, was, Michael did something very unusual for us this season. He directed two episodes uh, he wasn't originally slated to do this one, but you actually had to rearrange your life uh, because we had another director drop out and you, you came in and did this episode and made it your own. And it's, it's fantastic. But I, I got to say, you, you, you saved our asses. <laughs> oh, uh, that was, it was easy, easy to do. It was a really, uh, it was a great opportunity. It's worth saying, and thank you, but it's worth saying that you put Jonathan Banks with a coffee cup and he can talk <laughs> anywhere and go in and say anything. He has pure authority. I, I was watching dailies from episode 503 and when, uh, when it was announced that uh, Michael would be directing this, I was so happy. I mean, it was uh, just such a pleasure to, to be on set and watch him work, Michael. Just, uh, just an amazing job. Thank you so much. Yes. And here's, here's uh, Nigel Gibbs. Here's Nigel. You can also we actually had a much larger scene for Nigel. We were actually going to go to the 410 parking lot location where Lalo crashed into the car. We were going to have our milkshake guy back, the, uh, the actor Nick Bush, who had the milkshake, milkshake spilled all over him. We were going to go to the scene and like do some police work, but just because of the, the time frame, and the number of scenes we we cut that out. We also cut out another scene with uh, Lalo and and Tio. Mm -hmm. They were going to go to a, to a corner and watch uh, the DEA uh, after having used Crazy Eight to tip off the DEA. Watch watch them arrest a bunch of Gus's guys. So our first time seeing Lalo in the episode would have been in that scene and not not just the drive up and arresting, which happens later. And I, I was really upset. At the time when we had to drop it, but not watching the episode, it's like nobody, <laughs> nobody knows that it works perfectly fine. So it's, it's always so funny when we, you think you need the scene so you need the scene so badly, and it's not going to work as well, and it, and it and it works great. This happens in lots of ways to me too. You know, you'll get a location that you just it becomes like an anchor, visual anchor, or something else, and then you lose it, and you think, oh, we're completely, you know, up the creek now, and then. The, the story, you know, the, the op new opportunities come up, you know, when you lose another one. So, Michael, can you talk about the planning for the, this? Is a, a very long scene with with three different lighting setups and visual cues on the screen. How how did you plan for yeah. this? So this we shot this over two days, um, actually, and uh, and we we ended up approaching it by splitting the scene into, into a variety of sections. There were like, five, as I remember it, there were four sections in the scene, opening and all the hellos. And then when the lights go off, that was another part of the scene. With the video on, that was another scene. And then uh, to the end, and that helped us just get the cameras where we needed them to be. Because as you said, Tom, I mean, this scene switches axes, which is a big thing in our world. When the you know when when everyone's attention goes to a different part, you have to move the cameras, obviously, in the lighting setups. It's also a scene about looks and about people realizing things and realizations dawning, and especially with between Kim and Jimmy. So you always want to be in the right place. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing to think that it took almost two complete days of filming to get this to get this scene. And then Phil, you had to set your own challenges here because again, there's there's video on screen and actors talking. How do you deal with that? Well, um, it depends on if they talk over it or not. Uh, and uh, so we they kind of let it play while uh, while it's in the scene, uh, if I remember right. And then it kind of plays under. So we've uh, 
we, we generally in the wide when we do this sort of thing, we uh, we let it play and then we clean it up when we get into close-ups. This look. Four million. Very funny. I, re I think I recall they, they were playing the audio on screen, but then dipping it down mm -hmm. for the actors. Yes. So sort of uh, interact with the actual screen. Right. Six zeros and it's preceded by a dollar sign. That was that. There was there was that look that Ray just did. I mean, uh, yes. If you're listening okay, and yeah. watching, go back and look at it again. This barely <laughs> perceptible head shake, which just breaks me every time. It's so good. And she almost she almost mouths no. She like like the complete betrayal, and you see it in an instant. And again, like you know, as an actor working with her, and to be on the other side of that, it's so electric, and uh, uh, it's she's so good yeah. at, tr at transferring that kind of depth. Ah, I just, I love her. I love Ray Seahorn. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> it's a great thing to point out, but it's it, the, the, this Ray is uh, leading, or Ray and Bob are leading a, a group here. This is just a murderer's row of actors. Yeah. Every single one of these, uh, every single one of these actors uh, is, is so brilliant. And it's one of the tricky things about cutting a scene like this is um, you're not in necessarily in anybody's head as michael says you there you need to be in all kinds of different places uh and it's it's um the, the blocking and the the shooting and the cutting are very this was actually edited by uh joey reinish who is uh who has been working as uh, skip mcdonald's uh assistant editor for for years and he is he, he just, I think he did a slam dunk on this scene. I really do. But he also did the commercials you're seeing on screen, which were shot at the beginning of the schedule. So he had to turn them around very quickly. That's right. Because I think on the first day of shooting, uh, Michael, you did uh, uh, Jay on the, uh, out with the horse there on the yep. location and then did Bob at the green screen. Well, because we shot on actual reversal film for this, it needed time to be developed. That's right. Yeah, which is some, not something we're used to these days. But uh... And then you had... All these effects and the uh, the, uh, <laughs> the the words. Uh, I think there's the something bottom. very interesting in Bob's performance in this scene, which is he's he's performing. You know, whereas Ray's performance is it, she's receiving all this stuff and is powerless to do anything about it. Bob is on. He's performing, but there's an edge. There's anger in there. There's there's a sort of hardness behind it. It's very funny what he's doing. But it's also a little dangerous, and I think where we are in the story with this character, it's 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 very striking to me. You know you can't do this. Shh, this is a good one. He just loves being Saul Goodman so much. He's willing to take a really big risk here. Uh, he's risking his relationship, don't you think, Tom? Oh, absolutely. I, I think he think he's convinced that he can talk to her and explain as he tries to do at the at the end of the episode the reasons he did it this way. For her protection, and it, and he's correct. It works perfectly. It's it's their plan to a T. I mean, just the, what she did with Schweikert actually helped the situation and make them uh, less likely to be caught for what they've done. They'll run for free. To open my safety deposit box and miss. I love the fact that <laughs> right now Kevin's father is a player in this uh, in, in this oh. story. Dad never ever did anything like that none of this is true this you know it's, i love what you said michael about uh, the, the anger in, in saul's uh, performance here because we we talk all the time about all the suppressed anger that jimmy mcgill has that helps turn him into saul goodman and it definitely comes out when, when he's being saul and that's interesting all those moments that we managed to get basically over jimmy's shadow to saul coming out just little glimpses Putting those two on screen together is a is not something you get to do very often. Mm -hmm. And it was such a joy to watch Bob on that green screen day because it, it was like being on the set of Mr. Show because it was ah. he was just like I got this. It's like he didn't need new car. He just he just knew it. He came out and did bang 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 one after the other. Yeah, <laughs> he's such a pro at this kind of thing. blackmail. She's right. One has absolutely nothing to do with the other, which leads me. Wow. And at, the, at the end of the scene, he he walks out whistling, wearing the money, and it's very. I, yeah. <clears throat> to me, that is like a very Bugs Bunny moment. And I always feel like this Saul shares so much <laughs> with the, the character Bugs Bunny, and it just I had to I had to you know it costs a lot of money to uh, to get the rights for wearing the money, but uh, I was like we have to have it. It's an interesting thing because there's one way to read this scene that's a very funny scene, and it is funny, but. It is so dark, and it, it's it's uh, it's it's also sad, and it's it's a very strange 
I have a very strange uh, sense, different, different emotions running through me as I watch it because it's very amusing, but also, good God, what is this guy becoming? It's ugly. It's that moment where all of a sudden I'm like, who am I rooting for? What's going on? And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, as an audience member as well, it's like uh, that's that moment where you also wish that he would choose something different and he and he doesn't because he's unable to at this moment. And it's a real interesting mix because what he's doing to Kim is horrible. But what he's doing to Mesa Verde, you as an audience member, you know, it's that whole thing that you mentioned Columbo earlier. That's this Columbo versus the, the rich murderer. Right. These guys are getting away with something. They're actually taking advantage of a. Yeah, they did. They did steal the artwork. They, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, that's what makes it so great, and you'll see it in the in the car park scene as well. He's actually standing up for the little guy. He, he he's he's behaving in some ways honorably, but he's doing it through such uh, dangerous means, in a way, the to his own slow creep moral into character. Rex here is so fantastic yeah. into his head. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so great. Very very Kubrick. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you want, it just keeps going. You're like, oh, how far are we going to go? I think there was an issue, too, with the, uh, the the motorized Zoom control. It kept kind of ratcheting. Stretch, stretching its, face, its capabilities, I think. Yeah. I think there might have been like a, a post fix in one, in one part of the, uh, the Zoom because it did, did rack up, you know. I love how he's now heard the phone number so many times he knows it by heart. <laughs> and that was a that was an addition by Rex to add the uh, today part of the <laughs> that was not scripted. He, was, he wanted to copy it exactly from the commercial. Stay there. This is a, a great lighting department replacing all the lights on this floor to give it that unhealthy green quality. The pallor. Yeah. <laughs> This the way you guys shot this scene is uh, one of my favorites. I just th there's something about the way this is blocked and lit and composed. It really, it, in a weird way, it reminds me of uh, all the president's men. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it's yeah. like the comic version of that, but it's it's not that comic because he is well, so angry. As you point it. out, it, it it would be comic, and it is. It's actually fun to watch. Except you kind of get that sense that something is slipping inside of him. It also feels like Rex might just decide <laughs> to take his head off his shoulders <laughs> with one Which twist. Think, you know, uh, Rex might be thinking that this is part of the part of Jimmy's plan to get me to, to punch him and then, then sue me for everything I've got. But he's it's uh, Jimmy knows I, I get this guy into a, a gentleman's agree agreement, a handshake, and. I've got him. He's gonna. He's gonna keep his word on this. This is all he needs. This was a hard location to get up to. Too, there was a very tiny elevator. I think I remember, and uh, just a lot of people running up and down stairs to to get to this. The elevator broke. There was a, the elevator broke at one point. Oh, okay. was, <laughs> I feel uh, like <laughs> I remember that there were some protests going on down right down below. So that was probably a sound. A sound difficulty for you, Phil. Yeah, I, I remember that correctly. And then we couldn't get our gear down the uh, the elevator. We had to just send it down eight eight floors of of yeah. going around in circles. You can open your eyes now. I love your the framing on this. Well, a bunch of the shots where there were Rex is short sighted. He's just looking yeah. right into the frame. Is it was beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This was a fun day. <laughs> we, we, I might believe you showed up. Track. You showed up wanting to face one direction, but the sun was. Wait, the sun didn't. Uh, wasn't that didn't interesting? Cooperate, no. <laughs> so you came up with this new but, angle but, right here, which is fortunately it was just a. We owned all the elements. Like that was our, you know, it was our uh, truck and our people. So we just <laughs> we did a ninety degree flip. I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more, more Mike the cop. Yeah, he's just so comfortable doing this. Twenty-six got a hit on a New Mexico plate. One Victor, one five. I think this was uh, this whole sequence was one that we originally conceived of as a, a nighttime scene, and we switched it today just to make it just to make it more shootable. I think it works right. great. 
Yeah, we mm-hmm. were gonna have we were gonna show Lalo dropping Nacho off and, and seeing Nacho make the phone call, but again, just it was just for simplicity's sake, just uh, cut it down to just hearing Nacho's voice on the phone. I feel like we we this is we're talking a lot about scenes that we cut, but this was a it's even a super ambitious episode just the way it is. I can't picture I can't picture us adding anything. <laughs> <laughs> it is. A, I just. I was just. Yeah. Just trying to get and help everyone get a glimpse into the process. So you, you think of all, all the things you, you need, and then you know just end up uh, trimming it down because it's just there's only so many days you can shoot. You have a schedule to make. Like Michael Morris has a you know number yeah. of shots he wants to get and get them in right. a certain amount of time, and it's it's not an easy thing. He was so mm-hmm. great in this, Tony. He he, he just has that. He knows he knows what his options are. I think he he made me think he was going to actually do something rash for a lot. I love this shot uh, for a lot longer than uh, than I expected to. And then he, when he gives it up, there it's kind of a, a surprise. Oh, smoke on the water! There's your smoke on the water uh, again. Wow. <laughs> Tom, did you teach Bob how to play smoke on the water? I did show I did show him the basics of it. Yeah, he's I think he's he's got some guitar knowledge already. But I just uh, showed him for anyone at home. It's the uh, A and D strings uh, start on the fifth fret up to the eighth and tenth. <laughs> I think if any you, if you watch watch Ray in this scene and think back to Katie Beth Hall at the beginning of the episode, and I think you see the same person. Mm. The same person that ha- you know is 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 dealing with someone unpredictable and and. And uh, in some sense, is out of control. Be it her mother who's been drinking, or be it you know uh, Jimmy who's becoming Saul, and you see that same kind of internal reaction that that little girl had at the beginning. So I, it's so great the way you started with a glimpse of the past without explaining why. I think it comes it comes to life here. No, great. See, that and so often we talk about the uh, Annie Hall scene where uh, uh, the lobsters. Mm-hmm. And this is just another moment of uh, <laughs> when when Jimmy tries to get uh, Kim to do the voice, do do Kevin's voice, uh, which you know in the previous episode, the great scene written by Heather Marion, where where Kim does does Kevin's voice, and he's like trying to bring back the magic again, but no, it's it's something is something is wrong here. He knows he screwed her over. He knows he screwed Kim over, but he thinks he thinks he's going to be able to talk his way out of this. But he doesn't understand the depth of hurt in this in this moment, which I think the having the teaser that we did really helps this moment. I don't I don't even think we understood at the time of how how much that young Kim teaser played into everything. But it, it just it just works. They rhyme. They really do. They they and also watch Bob in the scene. I mean, it's. It, it, Ray is, uh, is obviously just doing some s- fabulous work, especially as we get to the end. But the way Bob escalates and crescendos into his like desperation to to not have this spin out of control and eventually lose options, he he's not able to to control what what Kim does at the end of the scene. I think it's it, it's it's a, it's a really lovely performance from him. I love this framing you have, Michael, with the with with Bob on the right side of the frame, but the doorway is centered, yeah. just the depth there. It's just it's such a beautiful shot. I don't. Okay. And they're both short-sighted. Like yeah. as Phil was observing earlier, you know, it's just, it's a, it, it's a composition that makes you feel something's up, something's yeah. off. Some anxiety somehow. Mm-hmm. Fuck you, Jack. Oh, so <laughs> great! Words, was that words. one of our two? That was that was two <laughs> were allowed. Yeah, but what a, what an incredible job by Ray Seahorn here to go from that so fu great. moment on this roller coaster and and logically get get it to where she ends up, where she pitches. Maybe we get married at the at the end of the scene. I can't I can't even describe how difficult that is, and, and Michael, how how great she she did it. Got it made it through this. Well, thank you, but I think also it's worth, and Patrick knows this very well, the actors on this show work with each other, and Bob was absolutely, you know, hand in glove with every transition in this scene, and the two of them um, had discussed it a lot and and had discussed what was behind it, and we all rehearsed it. We rehearsed it before the day and on the day. 
This is this is well, it's a, a skillful. It's a lot. It's, yeah, go ahead. Fred. Sorry, no, it, it, it's a lot. But uh, to, to be fair, when she first read it, she immediately called me and she said, "Did you see what Schnauz gave me to do?" <laughs> <laughs> because it is. It's a. It's it's a such a hard, crazy turn to make real. At any point, it can fall off and not play and not play true. But you know. In her hands, she makes it work because it's there on the page to work. It's just a very delicate thing to get through. And Michael, you did something here that we do not do often, and you convinced Marshall or DP Marshall Adams to do, which is you you had cameras on both sides here, mm -hmm. shooting them simultaneously—a camera on Ray and a camera on Bob. Because they're so the the the, the leaps they're making emotionally are so uh, obscure that you want to be able to, and they're so dialed into each other that you really want to them not to have to recreate it an hour and a half later for it, you know, for the other side. So oh, great. Great ending. Ah. Great ending. You guys. That's a nice ending for an episode. Wow. <laughs> wow. And so well done on that final scene too, Michael, because uh, you did not have a lot of time. There was, it was just running out and you, you managed to get those great shots of performances. Thank you. Great, great episode. Yay! Yay. So happy. Excellent work. Fantastic. Bye, everybody.